We are in the season of Pentecost, and we are doing a series on how God's Word works and the power of God's Word, looking especially this morning at how that Word, through that Word, Christ creates committed followers. And so we'll see that in our lessons and hymns and especially the sermon this morning. There are a couple of ways that you can follow along with the service. You can use the bulletins that are available in the back, and we'll also have everything on our screens so that you can see it on there as well. We'll begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart, I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that, loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. Elisha the prophet commits himself completely to the work to which the Lord has called him, leaving family and wealth behind. A lesson from 1 Kings chapter 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. 
Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come, ba- and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 62. We'll be singing Psalm 62D, I'll Not Be Shaken. Our soloist will introduce the, the, the psalm, and then you are invited to join in when you feel comfortable. Our second reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. 
Christ had shown grace to Paul, and that grace moved Paul to be committed to Christ. A lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 9. It will serve as the basis of our sermon lesson this morning. Jesus teaches that following him means leaving this world behind. The gospel from Luke chapter 9. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, and the children are invited forward for the children's message. How
How's everybody doing this morning? Is it a two thumbs up day? Awesome. Good. It's good to see you all again. Who or what is your favorite sports team? You have a favorite sports team? Hmm. You like soccer? It's a good sport. Yeah. How about you, Kai? The Miami Dolphins. All right. (laughs) Already talking. Amazing. (laughs) I brought up a couple of things to, to show who my favorite sports teams are. This is one I think you all might know. What team is this? Well, close. (laughs) Baseball. Who's the baseball team in Atlanta? The Braves. That's right. The world champion Braves. Let's not forget that part. They won the World Series last year. And another one of my favorite teams. Do you know who this is? Michigan. Michigan. That's right, girls. Good job. The Michigan Wolverines. Very good. If you see somebody walking around wearing a hat like this or a t-shirt like this, what are they saying? That they are, exactly, that they're cheering for that team. That's right. You know, some people have a way of showing that they are on Jesus' team. Do you see this? What is this? A cross. A lot of people walk around with a cross to show that they are Christians, that they follow Jesus. It's easy to follow Jesus when things are going well in life, right? When when things are easy, right? Like when your team is winning, it's easy to follow them. But what about when your team is losing and they play badly? That's kind of hard then, isn't it? It's kind of hard to be a fan of of a losing team. You can cheer for them so they work harder. Good. That's right. In life, sometimes it doesn't go so well. All right? Sometimes you fall and, and you scrape something or you get a bunch of mosquito bites on vacation, right? And it hurts. That happens to you? Yeah. Yeah, we all get a lot of mosquito bites in the summer, don't we? Yeah. But we can... St- Still be on Jesus' team, especially when things aren't going well, because who heals our bodies? Jesus does. He makes us feel better. And, and those mosquito bites don't last forever, do they? No, they go away. Jesus eventually heals our bodies. And so we can be on Jesus' team no matter what happens in this life. Let's pray about that. So let's fold our hands and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, Forgive us for the times we have chosen to follow our own desires instead of yours. Help us as we struggle with temptations every day and lead us always back to you through your precious word. And all of God's children shouted, Amen. Amen. You can go back to your seats and we'll continue with the hymn of the day.
Have you ever heard the phrase, a fair weather fan? It's a term that describes somebody who half heartedly follows a sports team. If that team is playing well, if they're winning a lot of games, or maybe if they're in the playoffs or a nationally televised game, then they'll watch and support that team. But if things are not going well, if the team is losing, then they pay no attention to it. Now, when it comes to sports, that's okay. That's fine. There are plenty of other things in this life that need our, our time and attention, and if that's just not one of your passions, it's okay. But I think we also all know the opposite of a fair weather fan the die hard the true fanatic, the one who schedules their life around their favorite team's games. That person watches win or lose. They know all the stats. They know the players and their positions. They know even the history of the team. Fairweather fan, diehard fan. When it comes to how we follow Jesus, which type of fan should we be? I think we all know, right? A diehard fan. One who never misses a game. One who knows the history and the stats as if they were a part of our very own fabric and being. And yet oftentimes... We find ourselves more like the fair weather fan who follows Jesus when it's convenient, who will talk about being a Christian when it's socially advantageous, who is willing to follow Jesus as long as it doesn't take much sacrifice or personal cost. This morning, as we study God's Word, we're going to see what Jesus has to say to his followers and to some would-be followers. And we're going to examine our own hearts and attitudes to see what Jesus has to say to us about the way that we follow him. May God grant us clarity and grace this morning as we do so. The Gospel reading begins with Luke telling us that the time was near for Jesus to be taken up into heaven. And so Jesus resolutely sets his face toward Jerusalem. But apparently, nobody told Jesus that he wasn't supposed to go through Samaria because the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They were like the Hatfields and the McCoys. And if that reference doesn't help you out. We've already talked about sports, so a Georgia Bulldog fan and a Florida Gator fan, all right? Alabama, Auburn, Michigan, Ohio State, Yankees, Red Sox, and if that's not doing anything for you, Sharks and Jets from the West Side Story. I think you're getting it, right? They did not like each other at all. Jews would not travel through Samaria. Samaritans would not go to Jerusalem. They avoided each other at all costs but not Jesus. He's going to go straight through to Jerusalem. That's the fastest way through the heart of Samaria. I imagine the disciples were a little bit skeptical of this plan. They knew the tension between these two groups of people, and it seems as though their feelings were validated because some messengers come back from that Samaritan village and they say that they want nothing to do with Jesus. As soon as they hear that Jesus is going to Jerusalem, they're done. They reject him. And so that tension that was always simmering there turned into a boil of rage. And two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, well, we learn why they have that nickname. They are ready to call down fire from heaven to fry up those greasy Samaritan sinners. 
You've got to hand it to James and John. At least they were full of passion. They were zealous for Jesus. And it upset them to see people reject Jesus. And I'll even give them credit for their faith in Jesus to actually do that, to bring down fire from heaven. But they utterly failed in their application of their zeal. And they failed in their understanding of how Jesus was going to use his power. Yes, they were zealous, but zeal must be shaped by knowledge. Zeal must be shaped by knowledge. For James and John, their knowledge of heaven was like an armory of fire, of God's wrath and anger and punishment. What they did not know, what they should have known, was that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to deal with that anger and wrath and punishment for sin. That Jesus was going to Jerusalem for them and for the Samaritans, and for the Jews who would reject him and put him to death, and the Romans who would crucify him, for all people, for you and for me. Jesus was going to Jerusalem to take God's wrath on himself, to take the punishment of sin in our place, because Jesus was going to turn heaven not into an armory of God's fire, but into a decanter of God's grace. Jesus resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem to do just that. He turned and rebuked James and John for their misplaced zeal. When we follow Jesus, I wonder if we act like James and John sometimes do full of zeal, full of passion, but perhaps misplaced. We get angry when we see people disrespecting God, and and maybe you've even felt that way these last few days if you've seen some of the signs on TV and the protests. People mocking God and his word, turning their back on him, insulting him, ridiculing him. And you think to yourself, maybe you even say, God, Don't you see this? Don't you see how they are treating you and your word? When are you going to zap these blaspheming sinners? Where's the fire, God? And we act like sons and daughters of thunder, too. But zeal must be shaped by knowledge. And we know that we are not God. And so we have to let God be God. Let him act according to his will and his purpose and his timeline. Let God be God. And let's do what he has told us to do. Jesus says the first and most important thing is to love God above all else. To love him with your heart and soul and mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And in a couple of weeks, there's a little commercial for our July 10th service, Jesus is going to speak a parable that tells us exactly who our neighbor is. Spoiler alert, it's the Samaritan. It's our enemy. It's all people. All people are our neighbors. Jesus went through Samaria not just because it was the fastest way to get to Jerusalem, but because he loved those people too. And if they were going to reject him, it wasn't going to be because he didn't try to show them love. He died for them, just as he died for all people. And Jesus calls us to love all people too because he has died for them as well, even our enemies even those who hate us, even those who hurt our ministry efforts. As hard as that is to do, we are still called to show them love because Jesus loved them enough to die for them as well. Jesus knew that this earth was not his permanent home. 
He knew that the time was coming for him to be taken up into heaven, his home and our home. And so that gave him the strength not to get revenge or retribution on those who rejected him, but to go on into Jerusalem to die for their sins. We know that this earth in its present form is not our permanent home either. That we are only here for, in the grand scheme of things, a very short amount of time. And so we can handle it when people reject us, reject God. When people show us hate, we can show them love because we know the joys that God has prepared for us, the joys that are waiting for us, that this temporary situation will pass away and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. We are told not to get too attached to this world. That's the message Jesus had for the three men in the second half of our gospel reading this morning. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Hard words from Jesus. Can you imagine if that's how we treated visitors who came to our congregation? Hey, you want to join our church? Great! We just need you to be homeless and not be attached to your family at all. I don't think that would go over very well. God certainly uses people who own homes. God uses people who love their families just as he has called them to do. And God even uses people who attend funerals. So what's going on here? Why is is Jesus saying this? It's not the first time or the only time that Jesus uses hard words like this. In fact, he does it quite a bit in the Gospels. He says outlandish things. He says things that sound ridiculous to us. For example, he says, pull the log out of your own eye, before you talk about the speck in somebody else's. He tells stories, like about a shepherd who will leave 99 sheep to go and look for just one. Or the story about a man who is forgiven a gazillion dollars in debt, and then in the next breath goes out and chokes a man who owes him pennies in comparison. Jesus says that even the tiniest smidge of faith is enough to move mountains into the sea. Jesus speaks like this often. Outlandish statements. It sounds like hyperbole to us. It sounds ridiculous to our ears. But think about this. How powerful is the gospel? How powerful is the gospel? When we pray... Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus does. And God takes away our sins. That is more amazing. That is a bigger miracle than moving a mountain into the sea. That God can take away our sins because of what Jesus has done. That is the power and the beauty of the gospel. And so we cannot exaggerate enough how life-changing the good news is is of sins forgiven in Jesus. We cannot express it enough. It is beautiful. It is powerful. It is a wonderful message. Wonderfully ridiculous that through no merit of our own, Jesus died on the cross to take away all of our sins. And so let's not water down statements like this 
Let's not try to explain them away without letting them first hit us in the face. What is it in your life that causes a less than 100% wholehearted devotion to Jesus? What is it in your life that tempts you to be more of a fair weather fan instead of a die hard fan? What would Jesus say to the excuses that you bring to him? Christ calls us to be 100% committed to him because he is 100% committed to us. He is full of passion and zeal for you. Why did he resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem? For you. He knew what was facing him there. He knew the punishment that was waiting, the wrath of God, the cup that he had to drink, but he still went because he is full of zeal and passion for you. He wants you as his. Will Williman is an an American theologian. He served as the dean of uh, the chapel at Duke University. He would tell stories about complaints that he would get from parents from time to time. And they would sound like this. They would call him on the phone and say, my daughter was going to be a research scientist. Now she's going to Haiti on a medical mission. You ruined her life. Just what exactly are you doing in that chapel of yours? Our society has totally lost what is most important and its priorities are all mixed up. Not all of us will leave behind everything to go be missionaries, but some will. And what can we do to support them, to encourage them? What can we do in our lives right now to show that we are committed Christians and followers of Jesus? It might mean turning down a promotion because you know it's going to hinder your spiritual life. It means saying hard things to our children because we're raising them up not in the ways of the world but in the ways of God. It means not always getting the best of the best or the top of the line because you are saving your best for Jesus and serving him with all your heart, soul, and mind. Christ calls us to be 100% wholehearted followers of him. And when we take an honest look at our lives, we know that we've failed. We can't do it on our own. Only Jesus can create that type of commitment in our hearts. And he does it through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God. And so let's make sure we're giving ourselves the opportunities to be in that word of God so that the Holy Spirit can work that type of commitment and faith. Our identity is found in Christ. Being a Christian is not just an incidental part of your life. It's not just another description of you. No, you are a Christian. It is who you are. And it is a blessed identity because of how much Christ loves you and is committed to you. And so when you lay down your head at night, you can fall asleep in peace knowing that your sins are forgiven. Jesus said he had no place to lay down his head in life, but he found a place on the cross. After Jesus said, it is finished, he bowed his head and rested and fell asleep. Because it was finished. Our sins are forgiven. You can be committed to Christ because he is 100% committed to you. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed.
We pray. God of our salvation, when your son set his face to go to Jerusalem and the cross, his zeal would not be deterred. Grant us to pray with the same fervor and boldness, trusting that you hear us for the sake of the Son of Man, Jesus, our Savior. Lord of life, we give you thanks and praise as we celebrate the end of Roe versus Wade. We recognize this important step towards the value of all human life, born or unborn. You defend the powerless and raise up the helpless. While this decision will not change the hearts of people, help us to use the one thing that can change hearts, your holy gospel, and the good news of sins forgiven in Jesus. Help us to support all expecting mothers. Help us make spaces and places for all babies born, whether wanted or not. And use your gospel to heal the hearts of women dealing with regret and guilt. Let us shine as a beacon of faith, hope, and love in our community. Lord of the nations, look in mercy on our nation and prevent as much as possible any violent protests that may happen during this time. Frustrate the plans of all who seek to stir up that violence and strife and bless the efforts of all who promote harmony and peace. Grant to all in authority an extra measure of wisdom and patience. Cause justice and healing to prevail throughout our land. Enable us as Christian citizens to reflect your love in all we do. Let your gospel be freely proclaimed that true peace in Christ may come to troubled hearts. God of refuge, your salvation draws near to all who trust in you. Grant peace to your people and show us your salvation. Hear our petitions for healing, strength, and comfort for Alice Stephens, Virgie Dyson, Betty Graneman, George Ledford, Megan Johnson, Deborah Grigsby, Rowena Wickens, Alan Morrison, Daniel Brown, Tom Martin, Clara Lane, Marsha Blake, Terry Lamont, and for all those seeking employment. For Ron and Susan Wood, Barbara Johnson, Ed Taylor, and Shirley Estes. And for all whom we pray, be near them as the refuge of the weary and the God who preserves his people. We bring these petitions in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are a couple of ways that you can give a thank offering If you brought a physical offering, you can deposit it in the back, in the offering plates, in the back of the sanctuary. You can also go online to our website, click on the donate button, and fill out the secure webpage there. At this time, we ask that you please sign our friendship registers. Those are the the red envelopes in the back of the chairs. You can sign those, or you can scan the QR code and fill it out online. Please stand. We pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart 
that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, good morning, and thank you for being with us here at Mighty Fortress as we offer worship and praise to our God who has done so much for us. Uh, thank you to April, our guest musician today, filling in for Robin, and for our technicians, acolytes, and everybody who makes our service possible. A uh, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, as you came into church, perhaps you saw that tablecloth with the blue uh, right before you came into the sanctuary. Uh, it is our turn to help support and sponsor one of our Wells missions, and we've chosen a mission in Houston, Texas. And we'd like to send a, a care package out to that missionary and his family. So if you could write, even if it's just a sentence, uh, something short and sweet, just a, a little message of encouragement to them, uh, even if it's you are in our prayers, something like that goes a long ways for uh, our missionaries serving in those types of settings. Uh, so please take the, the time to do that on your way out. 
Uh, also, we do have a, an opportunity to view the Wells Connection this morning. A reminder that we are part of a large uh, church body connected uh, by the gospel of the Lord with many other congregations around the, the world and the United States. And this morning, we're going to take a look at uh, the ministry efforts, the teaching ministry that is happening in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. How are you? Can't complain. When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups. And they started designing one at a time uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom? Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about when he was last up here? Cam, what you got for me? Loud and proud. We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered, and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's all boys school. I was already struggling in middle school because, you know, there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all guys area. Think of it as a football team and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers. We want to be a family. Even with our lunch, we have a family style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table. We have a table captain. You want to work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You're always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Poverty. True? Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and then so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is like really important because He's like the main building block. He's what we all base ourselves around and like being able to talk to other guys about that is one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. Or you're on your game all the time and you keep on missing Bible study because you're on your phone or on your game. So whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm going to be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up. Fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here. And how do we allow them to be able to express themselves? We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I'll preach the gospel to them, right? But I'll then I'll give them some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in and coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of I need my Lord to get me through these tough times and it helped a lot build my um, faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's Word. Because you know everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable, talk to people without being judged. 
We're preparing young men for leadership, uh, for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MLC is a school for teachers. It'll help me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing out all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in. But how are you intrinsically a better young man? So, but to so be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards His glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your balance. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ, and so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we are doing it to serve Christ, so that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old, which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day. So uh, a wonderful example of the power of God's kingdom and the gospel to change lives uh, for the better and a wonderful part of our, our church body being able to do that. A uh, reminder that next Sunday, uh, July 3rd, we will not have Bible study, and I'll send out a reminder during the week as well, uh, but then we'll resume again the, the following week, and also that we have our, our membership class, our starting point class after worship today too. Those are our announcements. Have a wonderful week and God's blessings.